Welcome back to our live coverage from the United Nations Climate Talks here in Durban, South Africa. Delighted to say that I've been joined by uh, Murray Worthy. I believe you're a policy officer at the World Development Movement. That's and right. You're going to tell us a little bit about the Green Climate Fund in a moment. Yeah. But I just wanted to um, start off by asking you about the, the dynamic here at the talks, because I know that World De Development Movement brought out an interesting report uh, not long ago talking about the, the influence of some of the more powerful countries and how they go about these negotiations. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Definitely. We released a report at the weekend showing how developed countries, particularly like the UK, the EU and the US, have really used bullying and bribery to get their way over the last few years, especially while they're trying to kill off the Kyoto Protocol. So, for example, over the last two years, we saw deals being stitched up in back rooms without developing countries. Um, so what you're seeing there is the key players getting together without the people who are affected by climate change to stitch up a deal and then present it as a take it or leave it at the end. So developing countries are being completely left out of the negotiating process. I, th I guess the, the, the flip side of the coin is, is that you often hear here that these talks are very, very slow, that it's a, um, an agonising process. Um, you've got 194 countries, I think it is, all trying to agree on something. Wouldn't it be better just to bring the kind of powerful major emitters together and get them to negotiate something in a side room or in a separate conference? And then you might have the prospect of well, progress. Is that, why, why isn't that feasible? I don't think that's feasible because it doesn't give all the countries a fair say. This whole process is supposed to be about consensus and about getting everyone together to move forwards on climate change. And what we're really seeing instead is countries being picked off one by one. For example, in Copenhagen, you saw a lot of pressure put on China, the kind of this kind of blame it on China line that it was all China's fault. Whereas, in fact, it was developed countries that broke away from the entire negotiating mandate to force something completely separate through. We also saw uh, Connie Hedegaard in Denmark and Copenhagen claiming that there was no text that was going to be given to the plenary and there were no meetings taking place, even though it was being widely reported and everyone knew of its existence. So not only are these meetings happening, they're then lying to developing countries about them happening. I mean, that doesn't build trust for developing countries in what the rich nations want. And I mean, we really need to see people working together and treating each other as equals a lot more than we have seen in the past. And do you think that's something that we, we might see as hope of seeing? Because I guess it might come as a surprise to some people watching this. If you know, you're hoping for a collaborative effort, this is kind of widely accepted as a, as a crisis now, the, the, a, a global crisis, mm -hmm. and it's going to take a global solution. Why aren't people working together? I think it's because some countries think that by doing this they can force their own way through. So for example, as well as these kind of private backroom deals, we're also seeing finance used much more by countries to get their way, sort of setting up individual finance deals with particular countries, or saying, for example, with Copenhagen, the fast start finance has agreed this was 30 billion over three years, which was a kind of a real step forward in putting that finance on the table. But then countries were told, unless you agree to this political statement, you're not going to get the money. So you're then completely undermining and essentially bribing these countries and saying if you want the money you need you're going to have to sign up to what we say and there's no way that kind of a thing is going to end up with a real global deal and what's the difference here between kind of other aid that is given to countries because i think there's there seems to be a a tangible difference that's worth kind of picking out between aid that, you, that might be conceived as a gift and something that is, is, is deserved in, a, in effect. Why is money being transferred to poor countries to cope with climate change different to normal aid? I think the key thing here is that it's an obligation. It's an obligation under the convention and it's an obligation under kind of the concept of climate debt that uh, the developed countries are responsible for causing climate change through their historic emissions. We've grown rich off the back of high emissions since the Industrial Revolution, and that's now causing climate change, 75 to 80% of the effects of which will be felt in the Global South. So therefore, this money needs to be paid to the Global South to allow them to cope with a problem that we've caused. So it's an obligation, and it's an obligation that developed countries have accepted. But instead of seeing it as an obligation and paying up, they're now, every time we get to the talks, They'll put a little bit of money on the table and then say, we'll only move if you do what we want, and then we'll give you this bit of the money. Whereas what we should see, and what developing countries are calling for, is for a clear agreement on long-term finance to put that money on the table, and instead of trying to use it as a carrot and a stick at every negotiating table, but just to put it out there and deliver what's needed. OK, so let's name some names then. Who are, who are the countries that, that your report identifies as using these bullying tactics? 
in the UK he was one of the fairly key players uh, at Copenhagen. We had uh, Ed Miliband when he was the climate change secretary openly stating that unless you associate yourself with the Copenhagen Accord, which I should point out is completely against the principles of the Kyoto Protocol, then you won't get this money. Saying to other countries, unless you get the money through the World Bank, which many people in the global south view has been completely discredited, then again, you won't get the funds. So it's really forcing them through. But again, we've also seen the US using some pretty heavy-handed tactics for a long while now, because uh, as you were just saying, they're not very keen on uh, being flexible in negotiations. So they tend to like to use their financial might as a way of kind of throwing their weight around in the talks. Okay. And money, as, as we've touched on, is, is a big issue here. And, and uh, we mentioned in our introduction the importance of the Green Climate Fund. Can you give us a little bit of an insight as to what this fund is and what it's going to be used for? So the idea of the Green Climate Fund is to set up a new institution under the UN to manage climate finance. So at the moment what we're seeing is countries giving money in all sorts of different ways. And with this fast start of finance we've seen real problems, particularly with it being given through the World Bank. So a lot of it's been given as loans, which has massively increased the debts of developing countries, which are already heavily indebted. Um, we've seen money being wasted on projects that really don't benefit communities. So what we need is a new independent fund to manage all of this international finance that brings faith from developing countries that should be used to help them and gives developed countries some kind of certainty about where their money's going. Okay. And We've heard a lot from um, some campaigners here that they're worried that this Green Climate Fund isn't happening quick enough. Mm -hmm. They see it as a, a potential big win here in, in uh, Durban, yeah. something that can be signed and sealed, just the, the I's need dotting, the T's need dashing, and then we're going forward. Would that be your take on this? Um, I don't think so. I mean, I think it's really important that we do get a new fund set up. I mean, we can't go on as we are. However, the proposals as they stand don't set up a good fund that will meet the needs of developing countries. Um, we support what Venezuela have been saying about this, that we can't go forward with a bad fund that's not going to help developing countries. And it'll really mar the whole kind of talk around climate finance if this fund isn't set up right. So we think it's important to get it right rather than w rush for the win just for the sake of trying to get it in the bag. Okay, and what's wrong with it? One of the main concerns that a lot of civil society groups, and we heard yesterday in the plenary from a lot of developing countries, is around this proposed private sector facility. So this would be an arm of the fund that would be dedicated to solely financing private companies. And the problem with this is that you're then going to see the scarce public money that's available. Because the amount of money that developed countries are putting forwards is a fraction of the money that's needed. It's estimated to be over 500 billion a year that's needed to help developing countries. So with that scarce finance, what we're saying is that needs to go to projects to help countries adapt to climate change. But those kind of projects don't generate much profit. You know, stopping someone's field from flooding doesn't make you a lot of money. However, a giant uh, energy intensive, uh, sorry, a giant power station to support energy intensive industry will generate you money. So what we're going to see is scarce public money being used to subsidise these kind of projects rather than going where it's needed most. So this private sector facility is really going to skew what climate finance is going to be used for. Okay, and is there evidence for this already? Like the, the the, the money that is being given, is it being used for adaptation, is it being used for mitigation? What are the indications so far as to, to how the money is being used? It's pretty bad so far. I mean, adaptation is where the most urgent need is. Developing countries have been calling for financial mitigation pretty much since the start of the talks and in real urgency for at least the last 10 years. But if we look at the fast start finance, some estimates put it as much as 90% has gone to mitigation. And looking at the World Bank's funds, which are one of the major funds for um, delivering to developing countries, only 16% of that has actually been for adaptation. So there's a massive shortfall at the moment, and this is set to just make that worse in the future and not deliver the funding for adaptation that countries really need. Okay. So what's the path forward here then? This was, if this, you know, we've got some people saying this is potentially a big win at these talks, and this is one of the few things that we can look at with some optimism. Then what needs to happen in order to get the kind of results that you're looking for? I mean, as you said before, on the one hand, you've got US uh, blocking progress, but a lot of that's about bargaining. It doesn't want to give this kind of signed and sealed up to developing countries. It wants to hold it back so it can get what it wants elsewhere. But also we heard yesterday a lot of developing countries speaking out against these proposals. We heard Egypt, we heard Venezuela, we heard Nigeria amongst others, really saying that something more, we need more to be looked at in this. So what we really need to do is for there to be a real open process here at the COP, 
ideally to completely get rid of the private sector facility altogether, but if not, to make sure that it's managed properly and that the board, not donors, have control over where that money goes. So there are some really big issues here that still need to be ironed out before developing countries and civil society groups can really support this, uh, the fund as it is now. Okay, and how optimistic are you that this might happen? It's, it's really hard to tell. I mean, there's a, a big push from particularly the least developed countries and the small island states to get this fund up and running. They realise it's important. But at the same time, as I said before, there's no point setting up a fund that doesn't deliver what developing countries need. So hopefully you won't see this stitched up in the kind of backroom deals I was talking about earlier. And we'll see a fair process where developing countries get to have their views listened to and get to get them kind of incorporated into the design of this fund. So that's what we're hoping for here in uh, Durban. OK, and, and are the indications so far positive? We've heard that the discussions around this fund are going to be taken into kind of an informal space um, by the chair. And uh, it's not clear on how transparent tra- transparent this process is going to be. Are you optimistic that it, you know, that we are going to get what we need here? I mean, the stuff around the process was pretty concerning yesterday. We had the G77 in China, that's the group that represents 133 developing countries, uh, asking the chair for some clarity on what this process is going to be. Because there's no formal definition of these informal meetings. So it's kind of, are they formal form, formal informals or are they informal informals? And the chair really didn't give any detail on how this is going to go forward, what the process is going to be, is it going to be open even to all the parties, never mind for kind of uh, NGOs like ourselves to see what's going on. So, yeah, we're going to wait and see on that. But at the moment, the early indications aren't, aren't too promising, but we'll have to uh, wait and see for that. Okay. Murray, thank you so much for joining us. We'll uh, catch up with you later next week maybe and see kind of what the outcome has been. It would be really interesting to, to, to see this through with you and, and get your take on it at the end. Definitely, I'd be more than happy to. Okay, thank you, Murray. Uh, we're going to go to a video now. What we shot earlier with uh, Salim Al Hook of IIED. Uh, he is a uh, an expert and a veteran of these talks. I think he told me he'd been to uh, 16 out of 17 um, over the years, which I cannot even imagine um, how you would go about that. It uh, uh, would have worn me down uh, long before then. Um, but he's going to give us a bit of an overview of some of the, the big issues being talked here. Um, and he's also going to tell us how the talks have changed over the years. So uh, enjoy this video and we'll be back shortly.